I'm very excited about this message this morning. Uh, pray for my wife. She's uh, sick at home, so I'm playing uh, Hero Day with, with my son. It's just me and him today. We have a date after this. I'll uh, pray for her. Keep her in your prayers. She's sick. Um, Wednesday. Wednesday, we had a special treat. I taught. <laughs> but not because I taught, because we came up with an equation. We came up with a... We learned of a motivation, what keeps us motivated. And this morning, I want to bring to you some of that that we spoke on Wednesday, but I'm going to take it up a notch. So this morning, we need to use our Bibles, so I hope you have those handy. Get your cell phones out. I hope they're fully charged. Bump up the brightness. Get your apps ready, because we're going to be going through um, some verses. And some verses we won't have to, but I would take notes. I would jot them down. This morning, the title of my message is Overcoming the Insurmountable. And if anyone doesn't know what insurmountable means, just give me a second. Let's use use, uh, our cell phones. Definition of insurmountable. Insurmountable, too great to be overcome. That's right. Too great to be overcome. Now, we'll be in Hebrews 11. So I want to put, want you to put a mark right there. I love Hebrews 11 because I've been going there in my personal study. I've been going there in my personal time. I've been in Hebrews 11. I've been analyzing every hero of the faith. I've been reading all of their stories. And I've been asking myself, what is missing in my life? How can I be someone who is faithful? Hebrews 11. We're going to be looking at verse 30 through 35. But I also want you to put a mark in Joshua 6. Joshua 6. We're going to be in Joshua 6, and we're going to be talking about uh, Jericho. We're going to be talking about Joshua. We're going to be talking about Rahab. We're going to be talking about pretty much how Jesus is the center and in the motivation for us, for us in our lives. But further than that, we'll be talking about how we think things are insurmountable, and they're not. So if we're there, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. And I'll begin. So, verse 30 says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around for them seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she was welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now, my question for you is, have you ever felt like there's something that's insurmountable? Or ever felt like there is a, just this obstacle in your life that's just hard to climb. It's just, it's just hard to get over. It's just, it's there. I don't know where you're at with your life. I don't know where you're at with your walk and your Christian faith. But the word insurmountable, it's big. It's overcoming. It's overwhelming. It's over the top. It's something that we just can't comprehend how to get to the next level. Do you remember Jericho in Joshua 6? Do you remember how God had a plan and how God had a vision and how God told Joshua what he's supposed to do? I mean, it's a very simple story, but it's very complex to our faith. And I actually laughed at it. Actually, when I came to this conclusion, I actually giggled. I actually, like, chuckled. Because it's such a silly plan. It's such a silly view on how we are listening and looking to God when we need help. It was a big challenge, Jericho. It was overwhelming. Let me ask you, we've just come out of a rough month. We've just come out of a rough week. There's people who are feeling this very thing right now. Don't forget about Hurricane Irma. Don't forget about Maria in Puerto Rico, Mexico City, and the the, um, earthquakes. Events like Las Vegas. This word, insurmountable, is the word of the week for me because by definition, nothing can overtake it. But this morning, we're going to talk about how God can take that little word and make it seem just like a little grain of sand. And that's what we should be looking at when we look at these big challenges, when we look at what's overwhelming, what's over the top, what's what's overcoming. 
this is not a bad place to be if you're in a place like this. This is not a bad place if you're struggling in your ministry. This is not a bad place if you're unhappy. This is not a bad place if you're struggling with your marriage. This is not a bad place if you're struggling with your family. This is not a bad place if you're getting nowhere with your work. We talked last, I think in August, we talked about virtues. And we talked a little bit about Christ's corner. And we talked about the vision that we had for Christ's corner. Do you remember that? And I don't want to get into that whole the gladiator talk, the speech, but virtues are important. That's what we're going to look at, just some small things of Joshua and some small things of Rahab. Josh was a man of God. He was a Hebrew. He knew the stories. He grew up. He was but a little boy, a little grandson when they crossed the Red Sea. He was there for those events. He was a general. These are great attributes and tributes and Virtues of a man of God. Rahab was an immoral woman, uh, a Canaanite, and an enemy. Someone who was not of the kingdom of God. Both found in a simple place next to each other amongst the heroes of faith in Hebrews. But just as we read in verse 30 and 31, God has a plan for you as well. God has a plan for all of these people who have been affected by all of these events. God has a plan for them, and God has a plan for you. You can't do anything. When the time comes and it's upon you, you can't. But what can you do with the plan of God? My question is, we think and we think about what God has in store for me and what God has for me, and we think about what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do it? You have all these challenges. I'm just one guy. You can do anything to that plan. You can spit on it. You can, you can stomp on it. You can change the plan because evidently that's what we do. We, we look at God's plan, like we look at God's plan for Jericho, and we'll get there in a second, in Joshua 6. But we can say, I don't know about marching around a city seven times. I don't know about that. I I just don't know about that. That sounds silly, and I laughed. I did. I did chuckle, because the way it sounds, it's silly. And the way it may sound in our walk, in our place where we're at, it may sound silly as well. You know, when I talked about on Wednesday, what was the biggest challenge for me? I have many challenges. But the biggest was bringing What was insurmountable for me was bringing the gospel to my family. I had a wall with my mom. Man, I didn't have a wall. I had a tower with archers, flamethrowers, and all kinds of defenses when it came to my father. I have a barrier with my sister. And not because our relationship was in a bad place or what God was doing with that is because they didn't understand. They thought that this, this plan for them was silly. So here I am, one, walking around these walls, giving and shouting to the Lord until the Lord says, I'll tell you when the time is right. My brother was another one. But now I see God's plan. Now I see what God has in store. And now I see what God is doing through this place. Christ's corner, through God's kingdom, through the word of God, through trusting in him. Let's go to Joshua chapter 6 real fast. And I love going back and coming in because it's a comparison. And I'm going to tie in. I love to tie in. Uh, I mean, some people tell me, you like to make too many knots. But I love to tie in the class Sunday, school, church, Wednesday night, Spanish congregation, English congregation, the community. I like to tie everything in because it's all relevant to God's plan. So that's why I'm going to Joshua chapter 6. And bear with me as we put these thoughts together. Joshua chapter 6. So we're here. It's Jericho. Now I want you to read the first verse. Um, the new version, the new international version says, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out, 
and no one went in. When we don't trust in God's plan, when we think that things are silly, we clam up. We crab up. And we pull others with us. We shut that gate that sometimes not even God's word is an encouragement to our hearts. And in Jericho was like this. Jericho was tightly shut up. I love the words, tightly shut up. Because there was no way in and there was no way out. There was just this wall that surrounded this city from anyone coming in and out. And we looked Wednesday night, we made a comparison, and we talked about how big these walls were. And you could take a chariot, and you could ride along. You, can, you could probably picnic and set up a tent, set up a flea market on its wall. That's how big it was. And nothing could come in and out. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands among with its kings and its fighting men. Now, listen to God, but sometimes it goes in and it comes out. Or sometimes it stays folded up in our Bibles and we put it away. Or sometimes it sits in our glove department box in our truck. Or sometimes it just sits there until we look at it when we're in trouble. But one of the greatest things that I love about tying everything in is that Jesus is everywhere. And Jesus was in the Old Testament. And Jesus is in the New Testament. And Jesus is around us. So we talked about how Sometimes we need his presence, and that's what the study of John was about, and how he was telling his disciples, and that's what Wednesday was about. was about showing them how him leaving was not an insurmountable thing. He was going to come again. He was going to go and come. But he told them, don't just tightly shut up or clam, but trust in who, who sent me. Because I am coming back again. But I, taught, I showed them, and I love to do this, and we can talk about this, we can pray about this, we can study about this on another time, but I want you to go to Joshua chapter 5 with me. Joshua chapter 5 should be on the other side of the page, verse 13 and 15. Verse 13 and 15 says, The, the fall of Jericho. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you with us or for our enemies? And verse 14 says, Neither, he replied, But I am as commander of the army of the Lord. I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant?" The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. You know, I love when Jesus has to interfere. I love when Jesus has to interfere with our lives, has to interfere with what we got going on, because sometimes we have to be reminded that He is our commander. He is who it's all about. And he's, you know, when I was working with Mike during the hurricane, and I was working with my family, and I was working with everyone who was asking for help, I said to myself, what better message Christ Corner can give other than to tell them that we're here for the community? And I, and I felt like I was in heaven because I'm working with my brothers. I'm working unified. I'm working with the school. I'm working with the congregations. I'm working with everyone. And it felt amazing. Why? Because we had to fall down on our feet, in our, on our hands, and ask God for help. This is what I love about Jesus, and this is what I love about this little part of the commander. And this is where Wednesday, and this is where Sunday church, and this is where Wednesday church, this is where everything fits in together. Because we're here to be reminded who is our commander in chief, and who is ultimately in charge of our plans, who is ultimately in charge of our lives. That's one of those evidences 
that, you know, Jesus visited when he came down to heaven. Now, John 14, 27 says, and we'll go there, and I love it because it's comforting words. It's comforting words, or actually 20, yeah, 27. And we think about all these overwhelming circumstances. We think about everything that's going on this month. We think about everything that's happened this last month. Peace I leave to you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you will be glad and I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen to you, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of the world is coming. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded for me. Come now, let us leave. You see, we take this word, insurmountable, and we give it character, and we give it, we give it a face, and we give it feet, and we give it arms, and we give it hands, and we give it a belt and a sword, and we give it whatever it is that you want to give to it, and we say, I can't do it. Well, you're right. Let's ask God. Let's ask Jesus to interfere. Jesus knows that there's someone at that's around the corner waiting for you to feel like this. Jesus knows that the prince of this world is just crawling around waiting for you to just say it and to think that it's silly and to walk away from it. This is why I like that Mike said, hey, start in chapter 14, verse 29. You know, I love that this was a great, great story. But for us, what could be other insurmountable circumstances could we have? Let's ask, is the church work here at Christ's corner insurmountable? Is the vision that we have here as a family insurmountable? I don't think so. I don't think it is. Do I want my do I want success? Yes. Do I want to be happy? Yes. Do I want ministry to work? Yes. Do I want my marriage to thrive and survive? Yes. Do I want my family to know this? Yes. Do I want my work to be awesome? Yes. But it's not insurmountable. It's not, a, it's not something that I can say I can't overcome. Jesus says he's going to the Father, and he came and he went. And he's there back again. These are healing words for us. This is why I wanted to include what Jesus said. Because it was healing words for the apostles. For them to understand that it's not something that you cannot overtake. It's going to happen. It will happen. But when it happens, what did I say? I love the Father. You should trust me. Trust because He sent me. Trust because... I am the son. Trust because I am, like it says in the beginning of chapter 14, he is the light and truth and the way. Do you want your, do you want to be happy? We have to look at what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33. If you want to be, have a successful ministry, look at Matthew chapter 4. Look at Mark 9.35. Mark 9.35 says that we must be servants because who is first and who is last? And who is greater? Servants. And this is where I'm going to emphasize. This is where I'm going to take it to the next level. But wait, we've talked about Joshua. We've talked about how he needed something to remind him of the mission, remind him of who God is. What about Rahab? Who is she? Rahab was just an immoral woman. It was a person who heard about God's kingdom, who heard about Israel. And she asked God, she asked God through the spies, spare me. And they did. But why does she get a spot? 
Why does she get a memorial? Why does she get her name next to Joshua? Because the, the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus is not limited to a certain select. It's for everyone. It's for everyone who has sinned. Everyone who has come to him and asked for help. God uses ordinary people to change from the world so they can serve his kingdom. I want to say that again. I'm not saying that God uses ordinary people to change the world. I'm saying God uses ordinary people to change from the world to serve his kingdom. 1 Corinthians 1.26 verse 30. Let's go there real quick. Chapter 1, verse 26, says, Brothers, think of what you were, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential, influential. Not many of you were noble of birth. He chooses the lowly things of the world and that despise things. And the things that are not to nullify and the things that are, so that no one may boast for him. It's because of him that you are in Christ, who has become for us wisdom of God. That is our righteousness, that is our holiness, that is our redemption. Sometimes we think because of who we are and what we live and what we're in. That's our excuse to say we can't go on further. We can't accept this. We can't look at this. We can't do it. It's insurmountable. This is just an excuse. God uses, God uses you and He changes you from the world so that you can become a servant. We can't, we can't change the circumstances, but you can react to it. You can react to it. It's all about reaction. Will you honor God or will you dishonor God? Will you, be a, will you be better or will you be bitter? Are we focusing on what really matters here at Christ's Corner? Are we focusing on what really needs to be done? You know, Apart from everything that was wonderful and, and we talked about on Wednesday night, I think the conclusion was that sometimes it has to start with our hearts. Sometimes it has to start with us. We understand that there is many things that have to be done. There's many things that we have to overcome as a family. But we need to have our hearts cleansed. We need to be right with God. We need to be there so that when the things happen and the circumstances are there, we're ready to serve. We need to focus on really what really matters. Psalms 57. You look at David comes next in that line of chronologically, so what, heroes of the faith. But David had ups and downs. David had ups, but more downs than ups. And we look at David's story and we think about David. David was this little boy. God once again chose a child instead of a man with brute force and ready to, ready to fight. He chose a child. And we look at that and we say, this is silly. <laughs> David was delivering pizza to his brothers when, when uh, I think it was Nathan that said, look, that's the guy. That's the guy that God wants, that, that pizza delivery boy. I, I mean, the Bible says bread and cheese. The Bible says bread and cheese. He was delivering bread and cheese to his brothers. He was delivering pizza. Just throw a couple pepperonis on it or whatever it is that the Israelites liked on top of it. But it, he was delivering pizza to his brothers. And that's when they said, that's the one. That's the son that you weren't talking about. That's who I want to do my will. And we know his story, and his story is great. We get to Samuel. I think it's chapter 11. And we hear about how it's not great. How 
He lets a circumstance. He lets something that's insurmountable consume him. And we all know what that is. And that's his sin with Bathsheba. And we know what he did. We know what he took his first man, mate, soldier, sent him to the front lines, did what he did. But yet, David is still in Hebrews chapter 11. Not because of his sin, but because of where his heart was and how he repented and how he took that and said, if I am not right with you, your kingdom is not right. So sometimes the things that we look about around us, it has to start here. Psalms 23 talks about that. Psalms 23 talks about how we need to be trusting Christ. Psalms 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I should not be in want. But he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads, he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. What is insurmountable? Sin? I think we've come to the conclusion that we're looking at all these circumstances and we're looking at all these things that are big and now we throw sin in there and say, not even sin is big to God. It's a big deal because it messes up your heart. It messes up everything that you have done for the Lord. But let me ask you, was it painful? Did you sweat? Did you cry? Was there bloodshed? How powerful was this sin that it seems insurmountable to you? It's not. There's nothing that you can do that will take you away from God's love. Jesus took all the pain. Jesus took all the sweat. Jesus took all the bloodshed. Psalms 32 says, Psalms 32 says, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. I think when we have that, I think when we know that, I think that now that we can say, let me put it, let me put it in my pocket. No, let me put it around my arm. No, let me wear it. Let me show people that I have repented and I walk a different life. People will notice. People will see that nothing is insurmountable for God. The Christian life should not be up and down. I agree. It should not be up and down. It should be in and out. And I'm not talking about pizza delivery service. Everybody's hungry for pizza now. Got everybody ready and excited for pizza. I'm not talking about in and out servicing. I'm not talking about drive through But it's not up and down because we shouldn't have a, a up and then we should, we, we're good and we're, and we're, we're, we're having a great time and this is wonderful for God and this is just wonderful for what I'm doing and I feel amazing and people, people are just feeding that. And then I'm down and people are just looking at you and saying, what's your excuse or what are you doing? How could you do that or why are you doing that? That's not what it's about. But it's in and out. It's in for worship and out for service. We need to be here worshiping. We need to come in to worship. We need to come to church to know. We need to come to Christ's corner to unite. We need to show that this is a place of worship. This is a place where Christ reigns. This is a place where the community can get together to worship. And when we're worshiping in unison and we're doing things and we're helping each other out, this is ultimately worship. This is the end part. This is the end part that we have to tell others about. This is the end part that God is raising up servants. The commander of the God's army is saying, I'm going to you. And Mike went out to aim. Stephen went out to Harding. I forgot for a second. <laughs> he went out to Harding. But God's been doing this for years. God's been doing this for decades. God's been doing this for millenniums. But sometimes, as workers, sometimes as family, what do, we need to be, what do we need to be reminded of? God is in control. 
God is in control. God is sending these, these soldiers here. God is sending these servants here because he understands what needs to be done. He understands that we can't do it by ourselves. He understands that we can't just look at it and say, well, uh, yeah, let, me, let me tell you what. Putting up shutters, it's insurmountable. I can't do it. There's something about putting up shutters that just gets me. It's not. Or even doing work here on, on the weekends, or even doing work here during the week, or stopping by. The point is, we're worshiping. The point is, we're working together. The point is, is that we're not looking to go up and down. We're looking to come in and out. And I'm not talking about pizza. The holiest moment. What is our takeaway from this? The holiest moment that you could have here. Yes, you were baptized. Yes, you repented. Yes, you accepted God. That was wonderful. But the holiest moment is that when you're edified and you're ready, not ready to eat pizza, but you're ready to walk out those doors and serve. That is the holiest moment. That is the moment where God has touched you. That is the moment where everything comes together and says, what do I need to do? Who do I need to save this message to? Who needs to hear this? That's the holiest moment, is when you walk out those doors, edified, ready to serve. This is our church. And if we go to it's Christ Church. <laughs> this is Christ Church, but this is our church. And when I say that is because I was going to say, we think of it as a place that's being forgotten. Or we think of it as a place that, that no longer is thriving. Or we think about it as a place. We think about it as something that's, that, that, that has nothing. It has nothing. Dust, maybe. <laughs> but... It's not only just a place, but let me, let me just share with you. We are the church. We're going to read in, in Hebrews 11 again. And just as Christ resurrects us, Christ is doing and looking to do the same with others. Verse, um, we went to 30. Now, let's look at a couple more people. Verse 31. Verse 32 says, And what more should I say? I don't have the time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David. That's why I mentioned David this morning. Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered the kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses were turned into strengths, and who became powerful in battle and routed in foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised life again. Others who were tortured and refused to be released so they were, might gain a better resurrection. And that's what I want you to look at. Why are we going through, this, through these steps? Why are we going through these Phases. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why is God allowing what He is allowing? So we may have a better resurrection. So that God shows through you, who are the church, every one of you, me included, a better resurrection. Not only do we have to work out our salvation, but we have to have a better resurrection. We were raised when we were baptized but we will raise again when we die. And man, it's going to feel great. And I talked about how I have someone who's waiting for me there. Not just God, not just Jesus, but my dad. My dad is there. And how awesome it's going to be when my dad's just sitting there, like when I got a, maybe a, a third place award in the third grade, and my dad was in the background just quietly looking. How amazing is it going to be when I'm in front of the Lord and God is telling him, Bill, forget about pizza. You don't have to eat anymore. We're here, and I'm just so glad you're here with me. I'm so glad that you're here. 
I'm so glad that you understood. I'm so glad that everything worked out because I've been there with you. And my dad's going to be in the background quiet, waiting for my time to be over with the Lord. And how awesome of a resurrection will it be for all of us when we do this in unison, when we glorify God, when we chose and we choose that we're not going to change the circumstances, but we're going to react to what God has in front of us. Honor God. Don't be bitter. Be better. Mike, can you pray about that? First off, thank you. You know, I hear it all the time. I'll look around the congregation. Not a lot of people here. What's happening to all the people? Because our focus is wrong. Bill came to the school. He didn't know a thing about it. Harding's trying to figure out how to get people to come here because they've seen what's come out of Christ's corner. People that love God and want to serve God. When I went to Texas, the reason we get such a response in the mission department wanted us to talk to the mission department is when you look in the classroom, see things the way we want to see it like the world, but we can see things the way God sees it. So that's why I asked Stephen to talk last week about what, what's happening at Harding. And that's why I asked Bill to talk. This boy came to this school. He knew nothing. His only desire when I first met him was, I got to teach my parents. I thought you were going to say that's, pizza. That's our identity. And if we want to keep our eyes in the negative and look at all the other stuff, you're missing what God is doing. And we're looking with worldly eyes. God's got a plan and he's going to fill these views. But he's going to do it his way. And he's doing it through people that have been trained here, that are out in the brotherhood. And people are asking, how and why do they love God so much? And now they want to get involved. God's got a plan. strong. 